Grace, mercy, and peace be yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Going back to basics for this summer. Summer is always a great time to go back to the basics. And this summer as we go back to basics, we look at that theme of generous living and what it means to have our God who is the most generous of givers, who gave his only son for us so that we might be his own How that God who has given us everything that we have and his generosity drives us then to live generously in this world. The title for this week's message, God is Not Cheap. Does that strike you as just a little stark? God is not cheap. In fact, I was saying in the office, you know, we shouldn't put that so big and bold. It sounds maybe a little wrong. And I thought to myself, well, Pastor Adolfo picked the sermon series. And he's the one who coined those words. And it's Austin who put those on the the cover so big and bold. So I'm not throwing anybody under the bus, of course. Yes, I am. (laughs) But it is true, is it not? Our God is not cheap. He loves us lavishly. He provides for us remarkably. And all this he does out of divine fatherly goodness and mercy so that we might worship him and give thanks to him for all that he has done for us. Our God is not cheap. That phrase really calls into question what our view of God is. Is our God a God of scarcity Or a God of abundance? Think about that for a second. When you think about God, and when you think about us as his people living in his grace, and who have been given all things through Christ, do you think of God as a God of scarcity or a God of abundance? I can almost hear people saying, Well, of course we think God is a God of abundance. But do we live that way? Do our actions and our attitudes betray what we really think of God? Because while it might be easy for us to say that we believe that God is a God of abundance, do we trust him that way in our heart? I have to admit, on more than one occasion in life, five kids... Right now, four being, uh, having tuition for four kids at three different schools. There are times when I think to myself, God, I feel like I'm living on the edge of scarcity sometimes, dot, dot, dot. And I become anxious, and I worry, and I tell myself, And then I tell myself, am I trusting God? Am I remembering that he is a God of abundance? Am I remembering that he does not operate on the principles of scarcity, but rather he demonstrates that he lives and gives abundantly much more than we could ever ask or deserve? Or to put it differently, and I want to, I'm going to use a couple of words that are usually lo- used in the political realm. I want to take those out of the political realm for this. Are you guys with me? You can be like that dog in the mirror. Is God conservative or is he liberal? Not talking about politics. Not talking about fiscal policies. Although in a sense, perhaps, is God conservative Or is he liberal? Does he keep things back conservatively just in case? Or is he one who gives without regard? You see, God's abundance goes so far beyond what we can ever imagine. His abundance can never run out. It cannot be used up. It is almost 
like Niagara Falls, just pouring and pouring as if no one's ever going to be able to turn off the spigot. The water keeps coming. God's abundance flows like that. And such is his abundance that he has given us that his love has flowed so generously to us, liberally. In fact, God is so reckless in the way that he gives. There's not a person who deserves in any sense God's goodness or his mercy. And yet God gives so generously. And even in those times when we feel like we're experiencing the risk or the threat or real scarcity, yet our God continues to give. For his love never stops flowing. His mercies are new every morning. He sustains us day by day. And he gives us more than we could ever ask or imagine through his goodness and love in his son, Jesus Christ. God is not cheap. His grace is abundant. And he is the most reckless giver. He does not question what the return on investment is going to be. He simply says, these are the people that I love and I will spend to the very utmost. And nothing demonstrates that more for us than the cross of Christ. The Bible verses that we consider today from Romans chapter 8 are some of my favorite. Perhaps they're some of yours. I remember the first time that I came across Romans chapter 8, verse 28. Maybe you've heard this story before, but I had just broken my arm playing basketball. And after I'd gotten my cast on, the director of Christian education, my family's life was kind of all mixed up. He was as much as a, a brother or a dad to me that I had at that time. And he wrote on my cast. He was the first to write on the cast. In fact, he was the one who took me to the hospital from middle school to get that arm x-rayed. He wrote Romans 8.28. And as someone who had been confirmed just months before and really much of that time had ignored all the things that the pastors were trying to teach us in confirmation god had turned the light switch on for me at my confirmation and i'm just starting to dig into his word to learn what he has said and how abundantly he provides even in his word the view the picture of who he is and all that he has done for us, all he is doing, and all he will do for us. And I remember looking at that Romans 8, 28. It's just those words. I remember asking Warren, the director of Christian education, what's that mean? And he said, you're going to have to look it up. And I looked it up, and it read like this. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him who have been called according to his purpose. Our God, who is a God of abundance, is able to take all things, even the things that are perhaps disappointments, even those things that perhaps are crushing to us, even he can take the death of his only son and work that together for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. And then chapter 8, verse 29 continues. For those God foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, so that his son might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. What strikes me about each of those verbs, that he predestined, he called, he justified, and glorified us is that those verbs are all in the past tense it's a completed action because jesus who completed everything was that was needed for us to become children of god when he said on the cross it is finished it's complete these things were sealed for us and so it is as if 
those actions have been completed. Even that we have been glorified with him. And then Paul continues, what we, shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? No one. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? That's a phrase that I find you have to kind of grapple with. How will he not also, along with his son, who he gave for us all, also give us all things? Everything? Everything that I want, God, you're going to give me? All I have to do is make my list? It's like Christmas, right? Well, God is not like Santa Claus. Remember Santa Claus? He sees you when you're sleeping. He knows when you're awake. He knows when you've been bad or good, so be good for goodness sake. Well, you know, that's kind of law, isn't it? You better be good or else. This God is gracious, and so he also does not just give us whatever we want, but he gives us what we need, and he gives us according to his mercy. He gives us generously according to his love. And he has given us abundantly in giving his son. What more could he give that would be of greater value than giving us his son? Our God is not cheap. He knew that it would take that which was most precious to him to make us his own. And so recklessly, Loving us to the end, he gave himself. Taking our place, bearing our sin, rising in glory, bringing us peace, giving us joy and abundance of hope, the power of his love. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? And in many ways, in Christ, we possess all things. For we have even the treasures of heaven with our name on them. There's a home prepared for us, a mansion where Christ has gone ahead of us. And he who is the way and the truth and the life will one day bring us there where there is no sign or even scar of sin left, but rather the glories and the abundance in the presence of our God. If God is reckless in his generosity, he doesn't just pour out his gifts on you and me so that we can bask in them. But how does God use his gifts in our lives, pouring them into us so abundantly that they overflow? How does God's generosity, which is so reckless, move you and me to be generous as he has been generous with us. You see, just as God did not count the return on investment when he said, I am going to choose you, fill in your name in that blank. He did not say, well, I hope they're going to be good enough. Maybe I'll give something. But he poured out so abundantly his grace on us all. So also, God calls us to live recklessly in demonstrating the love that he has given to us. That with our hearts, our hands, our voices, everything that we are, everything that we have been called to be, everything that he has declared us to be, that we live for him in such a way 
that we don't count the cost of what the return might be, but rather continue to pour his love upon those who don't deserve it. Just as we who have not deserved it have received his love, we continue to forgive without limit, just as he has forgiven our debt without limit, and he has written that debt off written it to the account of Christ. And just as he has lavishly given us all that we have in this life, we live not for ourselves, but we see that all that we have has come from our gracious and giving God. And we spend of that lavishly for the sake of his kingdom to extend his reign. For our Lord Jesus does reign over all. And he desires that hearts would be brought under his reign. That they would experience his graciousness. That they would give glory to him for his goodness. That they would be filled with the riches of his peace, his joy, and his abundant life. In the precious name of Jesus, amen.